this video, we will explore Tile Diffusion, which allows the use of AI directly from 3ds Max. For this, we will go through the basic workflow, experiment with control net features for additional guidance, and finally bake our AI-generated image back into our scene. So Tileflow recently pushed out a very interesting update, which brings Tile Diffusion or Stable Diffusion via Comfy UI directly to your 3ds Max viewport. And from my perspective, this can really be a complete game changer for your workflow because it allows you to take your actual 3D scenes and then with the help of the AI, basically generate lots of different moods, lots of different shaders, lots of different lighting conditions, try out lots of different things and get basically a lot of variation, a lot of inspiration for your actual 3D scenes. And then you can try to take those inputs and basically transfer it back into a 3D lighting and shading setup. So we're gonna check out the basic workflow for this and you can download Tileflow on pro.tileflow.com. And for all of those AI features, you don't really need any of those paid plans in here. You can just use the free version. But if you want to support the development of Tileflow, which I think is really an awesome plugin for 3ds Max, you can also purchase some of those paid plans in here. But now let's use the free plan and see how we can use those features. So now in 3ds Max, after I installed the plugin, I just loaded up one of my demo scenes for one of my previous tutorials. And by the way, if you want to download my scene files, you can always find them on my Patreon together with a whole course on car rendering and lots of other additional goodies. So now we installed the plugin and now let's see how we can use Tide Diffusion in order to help us with the look development of the scene in here. So after you downloaded and installed the most recent Tileflow version, you can easily start Tide Diffusion by just selecting any of your viewports and then just pressing up here and just select this Tide Diffusion button, which should appear in this drop down menu. And once you do this, you have this new separate window, which will show up and then you can just easily move that wherever it fits. So if you do this the first time, you will see something different in here. And that's because I installed everything already. So you would first need to go through the setup phase, which you can find in here. And what you have to do is to install Comfy UI. And Comfy UI is basically the link to Stable Diffusion. So Tile Diffusion is using Comfy UI in the background to basically link or connect to Stable Diffusion and just uses this kind of workflow to basically generate your images. So without going much into the details, installing Comfy UI traditionally can be very hacky. And that's why luckily in Tile Diffusion, you just have this simple one click installation button where you basically just have to define an installation path. And then you just click this button and everything is done for you in the background. So the installation process is really, really super easy. As a quick suggestion, I would also choose a path which is on a solid state drive and not a traditional hard disk because otherwise the loading times can become quite long. So after you installed everything, you can then move over to the models tab and here you can download all of the additional data that you require to generate your images. So you have diffusion models, you have animate diffusion models, you have control net models, LoRa's, upscalers, and so on. And this is basically a hand-picked selection of those kind of models in here. There's a lot more available if you use Comfy UI traditionally, but here in Tide Diffusion, everything is neatly integrated. And that's why you have a smaller, but I think a very sufficient selections of models which are available to you. So if you don't really know what all of this here means, it's not super important because I think there's also a lot of other videos that go much more into the details. In this video here, I just want to focus on how we as artists can use Tide Diffusion to help us speed up our workflow. So if you have the storage capacity, I would just recommend to download all of those models in here. And I think the storage capacity that you require to download all of this will be roughly 60 to 80 gigabytes. So it can be quite large. That's also why I recommend to put everything on a solid state drive in here. So now after we finish this, we can move to the display tab. And here's where we basically select the viewport where we want to generate our stable diffusion images in. So we can just select in this case, this viewport up here, and then just press this activate current viewport button in here. Once you do this, you can see you have this additional buttons which appear up here in your viewport. Now, finally, we're ready to generate some images and we can move to the generate tab up in here. 
And you can see you have a positive prompt and a negative prompt. So this is what you want to generate and this is what you don't want to be part of that generation. And there's some default values in here. So by default, it will generate a fluffy red cat and it shouldn't be blurry, it shouldn't be noisy, low quality, or it shouldn't have any watermarks. So without going in any of those settings in here, let's just press the generate image button and see what happens. So you can see indeed we have a very fluffy red cat that's now appeared in our viewport. And the cool thing is you don't really have to leave 3ds Max for any of this. Basically everything is done directly in 3ds Max and all of the work through Comfy UI is handled in the background. So it really streamlines your workflow quite a lot. So now let's say we want a different cat. So let's press the generate image button again. And you can see that nothing really seems to happen and that's because the auto reseed here is disabled. That means it always starts with the same starting point if you don't change any of the other settings in here. So let's enable the auto reseed and then press the generate image button again. And now you can see since we have a different seed, we will also end up with a different end result in here. So here on the left hand side, you can choose your different models. For me, I just use this Epic Realism XL model. But once you press in here, you can see there's a huge variety of different models. Once you download all of the models here from the model tab, you can see that there's models for Stable Diffusion 1.5 and then also models for Stable Diffusion XL. So I said I use this model in here, but if you want to see how the same image and the same seed would look with a different model, you can just disable the auto reseed and let's say we just take the Juggernaut XL model in here, for example, and just generate it again. And then you can see since we used a different model, we also get a different output. And all the models, they basically have a little bit of a unique look to them. So after a while, you will just find the models that fit your kind of work the most. I said for me, I just use this Epic Realism XL model for now. And then in this case, it's also important to dial in the other correct settings in here. So in this case, because I'm using an aspect ratio, which is like this, I will also choose a resolution which somewhat resembles this aspect ratio in order to just get better results. Also, there is this button in here, which basically just sets the default or the recommended values for the selected model. So if you, for example, use here a stable diffusion 1.5 model then you just press this button in here and all of those settings in here will be set to something which is recommended to use with these models here as a starting point but let's just use this epic realism xl model for now and not make it more confusing by constantly switching different kind of models in here. So now since our original scene has a pirate ship and we're not really interested much in fluffy red cats, let's just see how we can use this as an inspiration. And let's just say we want a pirate ship in stormy weather. So this looks great so far, but let's say we want a little bit more of a unique style so we can head on to this style category up here and then once you press, you can see that there's lots of different styles which you can basically choose from. And let's say we want a line art drawing in here, for example, let's just press the line art style. You can see it's now selected up in here. And with the auto reseed disabled, we will use the same starting point. Let's see how the same thing here looks with the line art style. And you can see just by adding this line art style, you get an image that looks more into whatever you want to generate. Let's see some different style. Let's say, for example, we want a film noir type of style. Then you can get something that resembles more something like this. Or let's say we even want a cyberpunk looking pirate ship. Let's see how this looks now. And you can get some really interesting and unexpected results in here. So what's actually happening in the background once you select the styles in here is that it extends your positive and your negative prompt. And you can see what it's actually doing if you bake the current style. So once you do this, you can see that some stuff here is added to your positive and negative prompt. And this basically just generates then this type of style in here. So in this case, it will explain why it's adding all of those buildings in the background. And that's because the cyberpunk style seems to just add cyberpunk cityscape. So let's just remove cityscape. 
Let's just remove skyscrapers. Let's remove dark alleys. And I think like this, we should get a result that doesn't really have any of those buildings in here. Let's see. And now you can see by this way, we can customize our styles. We have a cyberpunk looking ship, but without any of those buildings, which in this case is maybe not really what we wanted. So this by itself is already nice to get some general inspirations. But the problem is that it doesn't really resemble our 3D scene. You can see I set up a camera in here. I have a pirate ship. I want to keep the same kind of composition and use AI to basically get something that really fits exactly my 3D scene. And in order to achieve that, we can use the control net tab in here. So control net tab offers various options to basically guide the generations here with additional inputs apart from your positive and negative prompt. So you can, for example, hand over a depth map, you can hand over an edges or a contour map and various other options. So especially the depth map and the contour map, you can grab directly from the viewport and that's exactly what we're going to do now. So let's enable here the depth map. And if you press up here in the display mode, you can also switch this input here to the depth. So you can see what would be handed over to stable diffusion. And now if we generate the same image again, you can see we don't really have exactly what was expected. And the reason for that is that the weight is probably too low. So let's put the weight all the way to one and generate this again. And now you can see I have an image now that basically resembles exactly my 3D scene. I can switch here between the none, so my scene basically, and the result. And you can see it really matches quite good and is quite accurate in all the details. So apart from the depth map, you can also hand over an edges map, which is basically some contour lines on your model. So let's just enable this here as well. And then it will use the viewport color as an input. We can previsualize this here by pressing on this input color button. So he will just hand over this image here and use that to generate some contour lines and then feed this into stable diffusion as a guideline. And let's use both of them. So we use the depth map and we use the edges map. And let's reduce the weight on both of them to something like 0.5 because I found if you don't use the weight all the way to one, you give it a little bit more freedom and you can get some better quality results. So for both of those inputs here, let's give a weight of 0.5. Let's generate an image. And then we get something that hopefully looks even more close to what we have here in our actual 3D scene. So now let's say we want a different kind of perspective. Let's just move this one here to the perspective view. And let's just, for example, move our camera to something like this in here. And let's generate this again. And you can see how easy that is to just move your camera around to just get different inspirations, different views from different angles. And this can really be quite helpful to generate you some reference images of how your scene should look like from different angles. Additionally, there's a so-called IP adapter that allows you to load some reference images into here and then your generations will look kind of like those reference images. So let's use Google, for example. And here I just Googled for a pirate ship. And let's say I just like this image that came up in here. So we can just download and save this image and then load that into the IP adapter. And then hope that our generations will look something similar like this. So now back in the IP adapter, I can just load this file that we just downloaded from Google into here. And we can use the weight mode here, for example, as a style transfer. There's different kind of modes. Let's use this style transfer mode, for example. Let's use a weight of one and just generate an image. And now you can see it kind of tried to take over some of the colors that we had in the original image and just try to do its best to kind of match both styles here. So this is as far as I want to show you about the control net tab. Let's disable our IP adapter, but let's leave the depth and the edges map here enabled. And now let's just briefly dive into the topic of LoRa's. So LoRa's are kind of mini models, which you can load on top of your base model. And they're very specialized in a certain thing. So let's use an XL LoRa because we use a stable diffusion XL base model. And let's go to the styles tab. And let's say, for example, we want to use 
the explosion style with the hope that it will add some kind of explosions in our scene. So let's generate this. And you can see we definitely have something that is somewhat exploding and you can get some interesting results using these kind of LoRa's. Let's try out a different one. Let's say, for example, let's go for something like lava and remove also this explosion style because you can also add multiple of those LoRa's together. But now let's not make it too confusing. So let's just see what this one here brings. And you can see it tries its best to just add something lava-like in your scenes. So you can see the quality we get looks quite nice, but it doesn't really have a very high resolution. And that's because in our basic settings, our resolution here is 720 pixel times 1280. And that's sufficient to have fast enough generations. But if we want to have something that looks a bit more final, we can use the upscaler. And let's use the stable diffusion upscaler in here. And we can choose an upscale factor. I just use now a factor of 1.5 so that we can get a height of 1920 here. Just generate this. And you can see that now our image, hopefully even still visible through the YouTube compression, looks much more crisp and sharp. So Typhlo also offers the options to quickly bake your AI generation back on your 3D geometry. And you can preview this by just pressing the display button and just use the result projected option. And now you can see it projected the AI generation back on your 3D geometry. And this works very good from certain angles. But of course, if you move your camera, you can see it, of course, starts to fall apart. So in some situations, this works really good. For example, if you have some very far away objects in the background, mountains and so on, where perspective doesn't really play a very important factor. This can work very good to quickly just generate something and then just project it back on your 3D geometry. In this scene here, of course, it wouldn't really work if you have some kind of camera movement, but nonetheless, this option is there and can be quite handy in certain kind of situations. So if you really want to bake your image, you just select your 3D geometry and then just press the bake results button up here. And like this, you can see it really baked all of this on our 3D model. And we can then further on use it in our 3D scenes. So from my perspective, this covers all of the basics you need to know about using tile diffusion in your workflow. And from my perspective, this is really a game changer to my workflow because it allows me to just stay within 3ds Max not really have to export everything to Stable Diffusion all of the time, which really slows down your workflow. Like this, it's very streamlined. You can easily just navigate around, move your camera, generate something new. You can select certain kind of styles and so on very quickly. And it just makes using Stable Diffusion much more easy than it was when dealing with Comfy UI, where you have indeed more control and are able to do much more complicated things. But in most of the times, you don't really need that. And like this, it has all of the basic functionality that you need. And you can just stay within your software and within your workflow. So if you watch this content under here, chances are that you also enjoy the content that I provide over on my Patreon, where you can have access to all of my scene files, a whole course on car rendering and lots of other additional goodies. So check this out if that's interesting for you. Otherwise, see you next tutorial. Take care and see you soon.